Good evening, everybody. I'm David Lee. I'm executive director of the Chinese American Museum in D.C. We are the first and only museum in the nation's capital focused on the and dedicated to the Chinese American story. Well, we are very excited tonight. We are at Eco Adventures in Millersville, uh, Maryland, and we are with um, Maylin Sanchez Barr who is a biologist and uh, the owner of Eco Adventures. And tonight she is going to show us uh, a lot of amazing animals that we have here. And uh, this is what we like to do. We like to show Chinese Americans uh, doing interesting things. And uh, we're very excited. All right, thank you very much. Let me take off my mask here so you can hear me better. Well, welcome everybody. Hope you're having a good evening. Again, my name is Maylin Sanchez Barr, and I'm the director here at Eco Adventures. Now, if you guys have never heard of Eco Adventures before, we're in Millersville. We're actually not too far away from DC. We're only 30 to 40 minutes away. And it's a small facility. We're a conservation education facility in which uh, we house over 80 to 100 animals here. Many of them are rescued. And what we do here is we use these animals to really try to connect people with nature. So we have all sorts of programs like camps, birthday parties, we have homeschooling, field trips, outreaches, after school program, you name it. We even had sleepovers last year, but not this year, unfortunately. Um, so we have um, all sorts of programs in which you can come and visit us. Um, so today, I am going to tell you a little bit about our facility, but not only our facility, a little bit about my story, because as you guys know, my name is a little different, right? You've got the Chinese first name, the Spanish so I'm a little bit of everything here. And so I grew up in Costa Rica. My father actually uh, was born in Macau, and he came over from the mainland China um, when he was about nine years old. Um, and then he married my mom, obviously. We moved to the United States probably when I was about nine years old. And again, looking for a better life, for more opportunities and whatnot. Now, all of those life experiences I've had, all of the cultures, the different uh, experiences I got to share in Costa Rica really shaped me who I am today. So I'm hoping to share a little bit of stories throughout the presentation today and show you some animals that have impacted my life in some way. So I'll tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about animals, and I'm hoping that you are going to have a really good time learning tonight. So let me get started. So first of all, like I said, growing up um, in Costa Rica, I grew up a little bit like, you know, predominantly white community. And um, it was sometimes difficult. You know, I had a discrimination way back then, and we do have it today, as you know, unfortunately. And so I was kind of the underdog in a lot of different places. And so for me, I love to teach people about uh, animals that perhaps you may be a little scared of or have a different perception, may not know much about. And that is my challenge, because I would like to kind of share these, you know, all these stories with you to see that perhaps they're not as fearful as you may think. So I'm all about the underdogs because that's who I was. So I'm going to start today with the rose hair tarantula. Hang on one second. And I'm going to come up here close to, so to the camera so you can see a little bit better. So how many of you guys like tarantulas? Well, I don't know. If you guys, are, you're welcome to use the chat over there. Raise, uh, go ahead and write down if you are kind of ha have a, a little bit of arachnophobia, let me know. But you know what? They're really not as bad as you think they are. Um, so let me get this up close and personal right here. So I'm going to show you. So this right here is a rose hair tarantula named Fuzzy Wuzzy. So actually, who would be scared of Fuzzy Wuzzy, right? Um, it's, it's really not that bad. So they have eight legs. They do look a little creepy, I, I admit. They have eight eyes, eight legs, but, you know, they're actually um, really nice as far, not all of them, obviously, but um, when you do handle some species, they really don't want to hurt you in any way, um, unless you're something like a cricket or something like that, right? Um, so, or unless you're hurting them. That's really the two main reasons why these animals will bite. Now, all animal, all these spiders um, and tarantulas are uh, venomous, so I don't know if you knew that, but they do have fangs that have venom. Now, there is a difference between poisonous and venomous, all right? So venom is injected into you, and then poison is if you ingest it and you get sick. That's poisonous. So those are the two differences. But over here, I'm going to show you the back. Over here, you can see 
these two little things right here, they're called the spinnerets, and that's where they kind of weave their webs, and they actually have the strongest um, substance on earth, natural substance, I should say. Um, it's really, really tough. Um, and they are able to weave, kind of weave their webs, but they're not like regular spiders. Uh, they actually like reinforce their burrows and they actively hunt at night. So they are hunting for things like crickets and things like that. They can actually eat little um, mammals as well. So we, I don't know if you heard of the Goliath bird eating tarantula, and that's as big as a dinner plate. And that one definitely can eat birds and mammals and whatnot. So, again, this guy is a little creepy crawly, but he's really not that bad. Now, if I stick him on my stomach like this, he will stick to my stomach. Oh, you know what? In fact, I need a volunteer. How about I have Mr. – come on, Mr. Teddy. I have some volunteers here. This is Teddy. All right, so, Mr. Teddy, I'm going to just put him on your uh, – right here on your belly. All right, so just stay still, look at the camera right here in your audience, and I'm going to put him here right here. And you're going to see that he's going to stick to your stomach. And so, don't worry, I won't let him crawl up your, your neck or anything like that, but um, you can see they do stick. And because they have these little toes that almost act like Velcro, and uh, they're able to climb up surfaces and whatnot. Now, some tarantulas, like recently they found out that they can actually expel a little bit of spider web, like Spider-Man, and if they feel like they're falling, they can stick to the surfaces. So that's pretty neat. Now, they will always give you, they will always give you a, um, like, if they're threatened, they feel threatened, they'll give you a warning. And so they'll kind of be like, all right, they'll put up their, their, don't worry, this is okay, you're okay. You can even touch them, and it's not that bad. But they'll put up their um, pedipaps, or just two little legs, and they'll kind of look like they're about to attack you, so don't worry. You're fine. He's all good. Now, do you want to hold him? No? <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry. I just wanted to show how easily they can climb up a surface. And so, you know, again, it, it is kind of an acquired taste, right? So you do have to get used to these guys. James, all right, we got somebody who wants to hold him. All right, James. Just give me two hands like you're going to get a present, right? A very cool present. Now, the only thing I have to ask is, are you allergic to bee sting? Uh, I don't think so. I guess we'll find out. I've never been No, no. So, really, these guys, again, they are venomous, but, again, they're only, you know, you don't have to worry about it unless, let's like, say, you're allergic to bee, bee sting, and I probably wouldn't do this. Okay, okay. so I'm just going to put it very gently on your hand, and okay. you're going to see that they're really very light. Okay? They're very light. And that's... All there is to it. Now, one thing is they have this abdomen over here, and a lot of times, one of their defense mechanisms is they expel these little hairs onto their predator's eyes, and that gives them a chance to get away. So you never want to touch, it, you know, especially a tarantula on their abdomen, which is their bottom right here. Okay, so good job. All right, you're very brave. Did you face a fear today? Yeah. I might have to get Sarah to come out here next, but... All right, so we're going to say goodbye to Fuzzy Wuzzy. I'm going to show you another animal that is super cool. Also in the same family of arachnids. Uh, so this guy, now this guy does sting. Like, well, I wouldn't say that he stings all the time, but he can. So here is, here is an Asian. Let me see if I can show you a little bit. Asian tarantula, I mean, I'm sorry, Asian scorpion. Or a scorpion. Um, and let me see if I can actually take him out because it's kind of weird. Can you hold him for me? Let's see. It's going to be nice to me today. It's going to be nice. Yeah. We'll get him in here. There you go. Okay. Oh. Yeah, maybe not. That's okay. All right. Now, what I wanted really to show you. He's not in the mood to come out today, although I could handle him. Um, again, if he were to sting me, it's not a huge deal. It would just be like a, a bee sting. Um, so the, typically, the rule of thumb here is with scorpions, the bigger the, the pinchers, the less venomous they are. So you see how big those pinchers are? They're almost like crab-like pinchers. And so you really don't have to worry about the amount of venom that, they, that this guy has. Now, growing up in Costa Rica, one of the things that I had to do is um, I was very lucky that my parents used to take me all over from the rainforest to the uh, mountains. We went to the beaches, 
And a lot of times we were in the rainforest, I would have to check my boots and my shoes because, and that was just like brushing your teeth because you would have to make sure that there wasn't a tarantula or scorpion in your shoes. And that was just the way it was. Um, so I grew up with these guys. I didn't um, really have any fear of them. In fact, they're actually pretty helpful for the environment. They eat a lot of the bugs and things that we do not like, right? So um, the cool thing about this guy, we're going to show you now, is if you can hit the lights for me, my light guy, Mr. James, um, he glows in the dark. So under black light, and I'm going to use the black light here, I'll show you how he glows. Let me see. Oh, it's, it's hard with the, There you go. Can you see a little bit? If you lower him down, I can put the camera on. What? If you lower him down, I can put the camera on. Okay. Out. So at the top, there you go. No, not yet. Oh, goodness. I'm going to fire you, James. <laughs> no, you're okay. All right. So here we have this guy glow in the dark under black light. Now, scientists don't really know why this happens, but sometimes scientists think that there might be a reason as to uh, for mating reasons to find a mate or to find food. So this guy also has these little hairs um, that help him feel around as well. And um, there's really there's over 150 species of scorpions and only about 50 of them can be deadly. So uh, there's a lot of Asian ones and a lot of Asian venomous, uh, you know, arachnids and, and uh, insects as well that just... Um, I mean, sometimes they're really, really huge. Uh, but these guys, really, you don't have anything to worry about. So isn't that cool? All right, you can turn on the lights again. Thank you. All right, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Scorpion. I'm just getting you guys started with the little guys, and we're going to move on to the next ones. All right. All right, so those of you who had a little bit of a maybe sweating, seeing those guys, I decided, you know what, I'm going to follow up with a little bit of cute and cuddly animals here because, you know, it's it's only fair, right? I ring out the creepy crawly, and now I'm bringing out the cute and cuddlies. So here we have, look at this. These are just some of the animals we have that we interact with at Eco Adventures. And this guy, how do, could you not resist? This guy is, is definitely of cute and cuddly. His name is Stanton, and he is a hedgehog. And the hedgehogs, they are nocturnal. And there's this is an African hedgehog. There's also European hedgehogs as well. And uh, look how he has his little nose looking at you guys. Now, he's puffing up a little bit. And that's what they do. We kind of woke him up in the middle of his nap. So he's probably not, he's a little grumpy. But you can see he's kind of waking up a little. And then if I were, we have definitely this little uh, towel. Because, yeah, if he, he were to kind of puff up a little bit, it would be kind of prickly. It wouldn't really hurt, and he definitely cannot shoot out those those spines for sure, but it would just be kind of prickly. Oh, there, he's waking up. Look at that. All right, so he, he has this kind of neat, neat thing that he does. It's called self-anointing. So he kind of just uh, releases this uh, excretion, and just uh, whenever it could be things like smells that kind of just, you know, do that to him, like, for whatever reason, he does that. But he has a really good sense of smell, poor eyesight. In fact, he loves insects. Uh, and he, do you have an insect where you can feed him real quick, Miss Jessica? All right, you're going to see him eat um, a little worm right here. Let's see. Did he eat it? No, it's right there. There's the worm. Hey, like I said, they have really bad eyesight. Oh, you're not hungry. So he's more interested in the camera now. Let me see if I can Can you hold this towel for me? Thank you. Okay. There you go. Now I can hold him. So, let's see. Can you bring, oh, can you do a little warm and see if we can feed him? All right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, he's not hungry today. All right, that's all right. We don't make an animal do anything they don't want to do. So if he's not hungry, he's not hungry. That's all right. All right, we're going to say goodbye to Mr. Stanton for the moment because we have a lot of other animals we want to show you for tonight. All right, let's move on. So, let's see. 
get my. All right, so the next up, I am going to show you um, one of my favorite animals. And the reason being is um, because I grew up in Costa Rica. And um, growing up in Costa Rica, like I said, I got up to do a lot of different experiences. And my uncle had a beach house, and he took me to the beach house one day and said, do you want to go see the sea turtles? And so I said, sure, I would love to go see sea turtles. Why, why not? That's awesome. And he took me, and it was at night. I was probably about eight years old. And this was completely a huge defining moment in my life because I got to see this enormous sea turtle go up the beach and just this just kind of just really slow, arduous process of laying eggs. And then eventually, after hours and hours of digging and digging that hole, uh, finally, she was getting ready to lay her eggs. And you can imagine my excitement. I was like this close to seeing that. And then all of a sudden, you see all these people waiting. And then they would just put plastic bags like this right underneath the sea turtle. So you, you I, it just completely just shocked me. They were, I didn't know my uncle was actually poaching for eggs. Um, and that was just a thing that they did back then. So everybody kind of used it for food sources. But also it was tradition, a lot of traditional, um, you know, medicinal purposes. And so that really kind of impacted my life. And I thought, wow, this is really, really wrong. And so that defining moment in my life kind of created who I am. I decided from then on, I am going to become a scientist and an educator, a teacher, to let people know how wrong this is. And then throughout a lot of begging my uncle, I actually changed his mind. So I really, truly believe that what we do here with the young folks here, the young people, um, we can get them to change the older folks' minds and do something good and make the right choices. So that's why we do what we do here, because it really, truly impacted my life. So I'm going to talk to you about some turtles. So here we're, and obviously I don't have a sea turtle here today, but I do have a terrapin. Now there's different, do we have the tortoises, terrapins, and um, turtles. So you can call everything basically a turtle. Um, so turtles are basically, um, you can say they're anything. They can be land turtles or water turtles. But this guy is actually a terrapin. Terrapins are turtles, but they're more specific. They love brackish water. Brackish water is a mixture between fresh water and salt water. And they are actually here. They're the state, Maryland state reptile. And they live all the way from, you know, Florida, all the way up north. Uh, northeast areas, even all the way to Boston and whatnot. So you can see these guys in like wetlands and whatnot. And one of the things that we, I love talking to, to people about turtles is that they are, they're a sign of longevity. They can live 50 or 100 years. So these guys can live forever. And that's why I am going to tell you a little bit about the problems that there are around the world with people just, um, you know, pet trade or also human consumption. Now, this guy in particular, his name is Crush. And this story is that I have, I have two terrapins, Crush and um, Squirt. And these guys came to us. They were actually um, rescued from poachers in Alaska that were actually trying to get them to Asia for human consumption. So they got caught, thank goodness. But they got 200 turtles that were taped to their bodies, to suitcases that were stuffed in shoes. You can imagine, and these poor little turtles, um, some of them obviously did not make it. So we were able to give these two guys a home, and so we have these guys forever. Now, we can't release them, and the reason being, one of the things that people say, oh, if I have a terrapin or if I have a, let's say I picked up a turtle that I found, you know, and you keep them for years and years, can I release them? And no, you cannot, because reason being is because they do harbor some bacteria and viruses while they're in captivity, if you were to release them in the wild, that could, you know, infect the whole entire population, and that would be a bad thing. Also, they're used to captivity as well, and they're not able to be great hunters like they would in the wild. They're not used to that. So definitely, if you have a turtle or, or a pet or anything like, do not release them in the wild. Now, if Ms. Jessica, if you can come, come on over here for a little bit, I'm going to show you our turtle pond. I actually need you to follow me. Yeah, Oh, not much bigger. So this turtle's not going to get much bigger. He's almost full grown. So where some turtles, obviously, like leatherback turtles, the biggest, it's, uh, you know, as big as a, a, a car. 
We have the Galapagos tortoise, which is the biggest land tortoise, and I am going to show you a tortoise now. But I'm going to show you the turtle pond here. Now here at Eco Adventures, I'm going to put him down here. Oh, no, other one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another Okay, so this is our turtle pond, and turtle pond you might see over there, there's a caiman that lives with our turtles. So we do have water turtles here, and then we also have our tortoises. So here is a tortoise, and the difference between a turtle and a tortoise is basically a tortoise is a land turtle. And, uh, and they do have more like trunk-like feet, so if you can see their feet, they do not go in the water. Uh, they have more of, of a... Uh, bigger kind of carapace or shell and the turtles more streamlined and flat so they can swim through the water this guy is a box turtle so some of you guys might have seen these guys in your backyard so they're very they're found all around here in dc maryland and what you want to do if you ever find them is definitely you can pick them up but just be careful i always kind of hold them like this so that the, you don't drop them um, and then I kind of look at them and their eyes and I kind of try to see if they're male or female. So this is really easy and quick to tell for box turtles. So if you look in their eyes, it has red eyes, it's a male. If it has yellow eyes, it's a female. Also have to look at their tail. All right, if it's got a little tail, then it's a female. If it's got a really long tail, it's a male. And then the last thing I look at is the belly. The belly is called the plastron. And if it's really flat, it's a girl. If it's really got like a concave dip, it's a boy. And that's used for the mating purposes. So you guys have any guesses of what this might be? If you do, you can put it in the chat. So look at the eyes, the tail, and the flat belly. All right. So this is a tortoise. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put him back. Okay, so we're gonna head on back over here. Yeah, one person saying girl, one girl. Okay, so we have one and one, and the answer is it's a girl. So, okay, now one thing about the turtles is that there's over 90 species of freshwater tortoises that are critically endangered in Asia. So, and, and again, it's one of the things that we like to teach people about is the problems around the world. And human consumption is one, uh, habitat loss is another, and that kind of thing. So you can imagine that, you know, their turtle populations are dwindling. Uh, we really, they really do need our help. And so about 20 million turtles are uh, consumed every single year in Asia. You can imagine how many turtles that is. Uh, yeah, and you have a story for, you know, the terrapins here, the Christians for uh, so that's one of the things that we focus on here is just sharing and creating awareness for all these world problems. And it's really kind of a difficult thing because traditional medicines, and as you may know, you know Chinese, Chinese traditional medicines, they've been around uh, for ages, 500 AD. And so you've got all these animals that they traditionally had to, you know, they, they thought not only did they, they could heal people, but also they're symbolic. So some of them are considered gods. They had symbolism of, you know, fertility or, you know, they believed in longevity or, you know, all the representations of these different animals. So it's really hard to come in and say you can't do this anymore. And so it is a tough choice. But unfortunately, you know, we're trying to do more modern medicine and let people know that you don't, you don't necessarily need to kill all these animals to get the same result. So uh, I'm going to show you a few things that I have here. Um, so traditional medicines, I'm sure you've heard about tigers, uh, a lot of like seahorses. So I have a lot of different kinds of things to show people. Um, I used to work at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, and I do, did have a lot of experience rescuing lots of different animals. So that has been my passion. I worked at National, um, National Aquarium, Miami Sea Aquarium, and whatnot. And they did have this seahorse exhibit, and I loved it. This is a dried seahorse that was confiscated, um, and now we have a lot of these confiscated things to show people and educate others. So we have this sea turtle right here. Uh, it, like I said, it's dried up, but real. And it's actually a fish. I mean, did I say sea turtle? Seahorse. <laughs> so um, 
the coolest thing about these guys is that these fish, they're fish, is that the male is the one who gives birth. So we have here a female and we have a male. And you can see the difference between the bellies or the pouches, right? Um, so the, the male will have, I, I actually, I'm going to show you, this is kind of different. You would think that this is the male, okay? But it's actually this Ooh, is the male. You see that pouch? Okay, you see that little hole? Okay, that is the male, and because it has a pouch. So when the, they mate, the female will deposit her eggs into the male's pouch, and then he actually has contractions and everything. And the labor can last 12 hours, if you can imagine. So that is actually pretty cool in the animal world. Um, but these guys are de being depleted because of traditional Chinese medicines. Um, and just other things. People think that perhaps if they're used for arthritis and other things. Um, so this is one example. We have also a few others right here. Super tonic. We have tiger. We have other things here. So well, how you can help is just basically using other, you know, other medicines and that kind of thing and just helping us spread the word. All right. So now we're going to go into, yeah. Oh, a cute little cuddly animal again. All right, so this guy, his name is Boo. And we say peekaboo. Uh, he, we got him around Halloween, so we kind of named him Boo for that. Um, and he does like to kind of hide. And he is an armadillo. So he is a three-banded armadillo. You can see three bands right here. And uh, they come from uh, South America. And these guys, um, they're, they're threatened in the wild. Um, really, they don't have any predators other than, say, like jaguars can still eat them. They have really strong jaws to be able to eat these guys. But they are very um, popular in pet trades and whatnot. Now, this guy was captive bred. So one other thing that I like to teach others about is responsible pet keeping. So if you know you have kids or grandkids that have pets, and they want, oh, mom, I want a turtle or I want that. And it's really kind of sometimes impulsive. Don't give in yeah, just yet. What I tell all the kids to do is to definitely do their research and uh, find out how long does this animal live. Uh, like I said, some of the turtles live 50 to 100 years. So if you find a baby turtle and you want to keep it, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. you better make sure that mm -hmm. your child's going to keep it, uh, you know, going off to college or going to have a family or whatnot. So uh, you can see this guy, he's super cool. He's got these really long nails, and he um, he closes completely. He can, at least. Let me see if he'll do it for you. Uh, let's see. Boo. Now, he's the only one that can actually close completely in into, like, a little ball. So it's almost like pieces of a puzzle. So they get completely closed in. He's not trying to do it right now. He's just kind of hanging out. All right, let's see if he'll eat. Maybe he will eat. Is there any relation to the pangolin? So there is not any relation to the pangolin, but he does look like it, right? So you can see that long tongue. He loves insects. So that tongue does help him kind of find ants and things. So he does look like a pangolin. And one of the things about pangolins, if you know, uh, they are probably the, the world's um, most trafficked animal. So for, again, food consumption, but also just the scales. They're used in, tr in traditional medicines as well, even fashion uh, and lots of other, you know, just they're well thought off, super expensive, you know, to, if they're on the black market, they're extremely, all eight species are endangered, unfortunately. So he does look like a pangolin, almost like, right? But when you put him down, he does, he, he kind of just, it's kind of funny to watch him uh, crawl around. Uh, but he is very unique. He has that car little carapace-looking shell that helps him protect them. So they are nocturnal as well, so we kind of woke him up. So I'm going to go ahead and say goodnight to that and put him back. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the pet trade as well. So, I am going to need my volunteers again. So, I'm going to call James and Teddy. You can both come on up. So, another type of animal that is really popular in the pet trade 
I've been snakes. Now, how many of you guys are terrified of snakes? Anyone here? Write it in the chat. All right, so come on over here. I'm going to stand back a little. I don't have the mask. Just hold right there. And okay. So stand side by side. I'm just going to talk here. You guys can you come stand right side by side so you can see kind of see. All right, so we've got two different animals here. Um, they are both called ball pythons. And don't worry, he's okay. He's, he's all right. I'm watching him. Don't worry. So these are ball, ball pythons that come from Africa. And they are, I'm kind of sniffing you over here. Like, hey, friend. That's okay. Um, and so these guys, same species. They're just different uh, color morphs. So let me get him in the front so you can see the head. Yeah. So if they get scared or you know, they feel a little threatened, they will curl up in a little ball. And that's why they call them ball pythons. And what they're doing now is they're using that tongue flick and they're smelling you. So unless you smell like a rat, you don't have to worry about it. So hopefully Teddy, you took a shower today and you don't smell like a rat. Um, but yeah, they're generally really gentle creatures, really just kind of, they use those um, heat pits on the side over here and those will help them look for food, almost like it's like they see in infrared. So red would be hot and blue would be cool. And uh, you can see they're pretty much, they look the same kind of look, it's just different colors. So in the pet field uh, or the pet trade, uh, they are now what we call designer snakes. And so uh, some people get fancy jewelry for their birthdays. I get a fancy snake for my birthday. Now this guy costs about back then when they first came out and they were, um, they were of course they were bred genetically to give the beautiful colors that they have. They cost $10,000. Can you imagine? Uh, so thousands of dollars for some snakes, you can imagine. And it's a, it's a huge thing. Uh, you can create different colors from grays and pinks and different patterns of all sorts from all different types of snakes. Don't worry, you're fine. Um, yeah, he's kind of hanging out. All right. And so these guys, again, they, they do make good pets, generally, um, as long as you don't like feeding mice to your snakes. You only have to feed them once a month, really. Um, some snakes, and some sound like you know bigger snakes, you can feed them one good meal, and they're good for six months. You can imagine. So uh, they they're pretty easy going as far as the maintenance and care of these animals. Um, and they do they can live, um, you know, traditionally like twenty something years. But I've seen one snake that has lived forty five. So again, if you're going to get a pet, you guys want a pet, just make sure that you're ready to take them to college. And, you know, when you get married, et cetera, et cetera, make that commitment, right? So, uh, in How long is a gigantor? Gigantor. So, gigantor, we had a reticulated python, 23 feet long, and she was the largest snake uh, in Maryland. And unfortunately, she passed. She was uh, 22 years old. She was just an old lady. And, uh, you know, that's the one thing they, they do pass when they're older, you know, that's just what happens with everybody. So we are going to miss her greatly. Um, but these guys are, are um, again, now these guys aren't going to grow that big. They only grow to about four and a half feet long. Uh, so that's why another reason why they would make good pets and not say something like a reticulated python. When they're little, you're like, oh, I want it so badly because they're so cute. But do you know how big they're going to get? And you got to make sure you got financially, you know, you can support the animal. The cage that, you know, the enclosure that it's going to grow into and all of that. Those are all things to consider. So, all right. Thank you so very much for being my volunteers. And I'm going to put them back. All right. Make sure you get some hand sanitizer for me. Okay, now behind me, I'm going to talk to you about what my favorites do. I'm going to wait for Miss Jessica to finish with her. But right behind me, you can see this macaw. And it was funny because she's just sitting there and you don't think she's real. But she is very much real. She is a blue and gold macaw named Harley. And if you can, um, if you can possibly bring her bring the camera over here just because I don't want her on my shoulder in case she likes me a lot and then I won't be able to get her off. So here's Harley. Harley, can you turn around? Good girl. You're a good girl. Can you wave hello? Let's 
see if you'll do that. Now, again, animals may or may not do things, so if I tell her to wait below, she usually doesn't. <laughs> so you can see her, she's kind of eye pinning, and that means that she is checking the computer out. You guys have to see what's going on here. So she, um, she is one of those animals that are endangered in the wild. Um, pet trade is one of the illegal pet trades is one of the reasons loss of habitat as well. And we rescued. So again, a lot of our animals are rescued and I have a soft spot for these guys and we take as many as we can. This guy had to go all the way to Georgia and a friend of mine called me up and said, hi, right, someone abandoned a beautiful macaw at the vet's. And they said, super nice animal. And I was looking for a bird, a rescued bird. So I drove down and I got Harley and we bonded immediately. So they do mate for life. We first thought he was a boy and then eventually she laid some eggs. And so we were like, okay, it's a girl. So sometimes I forget and I just call him him because he's basically, he knows he as well and he's just used to saying good boy and that kind of thing. But she is very sweet. Um, I'm really the only one that can pet her, uh, but she won't let anybody else. She's, they're very particular. Again, if you want one of these fantastic, amazing animals, they are great companions. However, I tell you from experience, they're like having a toddler 24 seven, lots of attention, lots of enrichment, uh, lots of, you know, cuddling. They need, they need a lot of that all the time. So if you don't have the time, definitely do not get one of these animals. Um, all right. So we're going to say goodbye to Harley for now. She can just chill over there. And then I am, okay, I'm right on time, which is good. Okay. So I am going to introduce now another animal that has been very close to my heart. And the reason being is because I met my husband from this animal. Now I went to University of Miami and that's where I met my husband who was studying and doing uh, a research project on the diet of the American alligator. So I became his assistant and I'm going to have my, my assistant come on here. All right, here's Teddy again. All right, and he's holding an American alligator. So you can see how, and this is a baby. This baby's probably about three years old. But we started, I started working with these guys with Brady. And the cool thing is that we, when I became his assistant, we would go, we would go out to the Everglades and catch alligators. Small alligators like this guy, tons of little babies, to the humongous alligators, 14, 15 footers. And you know what we did? Well, we had to pump their stomachs to find out what they were eating. And somehow we fell in love and all of that, and the rest is history. So some people have this really romantic story. With us, it just kind of works. We fell in love pumping alligator stomachs. That's the story. Uh, so here we have James coming here with another alligator that he's going to come and show you real quick. And his name is Wally. And Wally I love also because he is another rescued animal. All right, so he's going to come up and show you. All right, if you can kind of get up close a little bit so you can see. So Wally was one of my first animals here at Eco Adventures. And he's the same age as my son, approximately, because, again, all the rescued animals we wouldn't be able to tell. So this is what you do when he's getting a little wiggly. Hang on. Okay. So you're going to put him in a football hold. Hang on one second. You're going to put your hand right here. Whoops. She was rescued because one of my friends was doing research on turtles near Chicago. And he actually, instead of a turtle, caught this alligator. And he said, wow, I caught an alligator. It's not supposed to be here in Chicago, as you know. And they wouldn't survive in the wild, obviously, in the winters. So this guy was sent to me via Federal Express, believe it or not. He got there the next day. And uh, he was like, you know, she's really nice for education. Do you want her? I said, absolutely, send her to me. And here she is. So she has been one of our favorites for as long as I can remember. Um, and 
she's really, really um, about, I would say, about 13 years or so. But, you know, again, because um, we don't know exactly how old she is, we're kind of just estimating. This girl is going to get pretty big, like I said, you know, 14, 15 feet or more, where actually there are, there's another species of alligators. We have one of two in the world. The other one is a Chinese alligator. So that is super cool that China has the other species. Unfortunately for that, I do have to say that there's less than 130 in the wild. They're critically endangered um, also because of loss of habitat. And, um, and, but they're, you know, they're, they're still hanging in there. There's a lot of programs um, in zoos and aquariums that have SSPs, which are species survival, which breed these guys and then release them back into the wild. So that's another reason why zoos and aquariums are super important, not only for education, but for programs like these. So this guy has some really cool features or adaptations, and um, they've been around since dinosaur time. So I'm going to show you a few things. Right here, it has what we call a nictitating mem membrane, like a third eyelid, almost like dinosaur-like. Look at that. It has this, the nose and the ears and the eyes on the same plane, which makes them ex excellent predators. And as they creep up, they are, if you look at their body, you know, they have everything they pretty much need. They have this, this kind of armor back, which are called osteoderms, and it helps protect them, but also... Believe it or not, it's almost like solar pattern, patterns uh, in the back. And when they bask out, in you know they they kind of heat up, and then the rest of the the blood heats up, and it goes circulates back into their blood system. So they are very they're very cool because they do have all these adaptations. Now the thing that you do notice the most is probably the teeth. So if I can have, um, can you take him back? All right, hang on one second. Okay. All right. So these guys have over 80, 80 teeth. And one of the questions that we typically get is what is the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? And so if you look at the alligators, you can only see the top teeth here. Now with a crocodile, you can see both the top and the lower. Now this is a skull, a model skull of a crocodile, but also look at their snout. So you look at the shape of the snout, the crocodiles have a triangular, long, thin snout, where the alligators will have a rounded duckbill snout shape. So those are traditionally some of the two most obvious, also where they live. So we only have two alligators in the world. So if they live in America and here, you know, uh, south, uh, like Florida, to all the way to Texas, and even up to North Carolina, they've been found. Um, it's either there or China, so that's another way. And then the color, sometimes the alligators have dark uniform color. The crocs tend to have sometimes beautiful olive greens and patterns and things like that. So um, that's pretty neat. All right, so my time is running out. Okay, you can put them out. All right, so due to time, I'm going to now my husband. Are you ready? Okay. And again, I told you how alligators are super important. This is how I met my husband, and they've become such an important part of my life. We we now uh, we used, you know we house crocodiles, caimans, alligators here at Eco Adventures, and one of our important missions is to teach everyone about you know predators and threatened species mm -hmm. and endangered species here. Now, my husband, and I'll let him tell, tell you guys more about himself. My husband is Dr. Brady Barr, and he has been with National Geographic for over 20 years. He has done TV shows. He's uh, been the herpetologist. He has uh, written books. He has his own Xbox game. Uh, he's been to Asia many, many times and worked with animals all over the world. And so, of course, I got involved in that, and it's been one of my most treasured memories is traveling the world with this guy, catching all sorts of really cool animals in the wild. So I'm going to tr introduce Dr. B here, and then he's going to tell you a little bit about some of his adventures all over the world. And um, there 
Yeah. All right. Thanks. I'm going to tilt this back just a little bit. There you go. Okay. As Midland said, I'm Dr. Brady Barr. I am the other half of Eco Adventures. Um, I like to think the better half. Ha, ha, ha. Just kidding. Uh, there's the brains. I'm kind of the brawn. When the toilet gets stopped up, I'm the one who gets the phone call or a crocodile escapes. Um, but as you said, I worked for National Geographic for over 20 years. I was the resident scientist, explorer, um, their herpetologist. And a herpetologist is a scientist that studies amphibians and reptiles. And that really is my expertise. Why don't we go to that, that first image? Uh, for National Geographic, for, for 20 years, I traveled the globe. I went to some of the most remote places on the planet, uh, some of the most uh, dangerous, um, out-of-the-way places that, that normal people don't get to go to. And uh, it was incredible. You'd be hard-pressed to name a place that I haven't been to. After about 17 years... I started getting so many injuries, bumps, bruises, bites, uh, tropical parasites, that I was really slowing down. And I told my lab, I said, look, I can only do this for a few more years. So the last three years, National Geographic gave me incredible opportunity to choose the part of the world that I wanted to concentrate on. In the last three years, uh, I was exclusive to Asia. And I selected it for a very, very important reason. Let's go to the next image. Um, Asia has got the best and biggest of just about everything in terms of flora and fauna. And I spent a lot of time reaching kids. Here's a picture of me in Malaysia. National Geographic's really good about getting me into schools and places like Ego Adventures, where I talk about conservation and the state of the planet and the amazing plants and animals found in each of these uh, countries. So for the last three years of my career at National Geographic, man, I was exclusive to Asia, flying back and forth to various countries. But again, why would I select Asia as a herpetologist? Well, I'm going to give you a few examples. Let's go to the next image. We all know what a salamander is, right? Around here, a salamander, it's an amphibian, kind of looks like a lizard, but it's not scaly. It has moist skin, fits in the palm of your hand. That's what you might catch around here. But in Asia, next image, they've got the world's largest salamander. That is the giant Japanese salamander. All of four feet long with a mouthful of teeth. And it will bite your hand off if you give it the chance. But just an exciting, amazing creature. There's only two truly giant salamanders on the planet. One found in China and the other is in Japan. Sadly, critically endangered. That loss and human consumption. Now, when I was over there looking for these things, I found them more in restaurants than I did in the wild. But I did come across some of these true behemoths. And I tell you, of all the photos that were taken of me in action, with everything from sharks, polar bears, penguins, giant crocs, lions, you name the animal, this photo right here got more recognition than any other photo that was ever taken of me, me and the giant Japanese salamander. I like to call Asia the land of the giants, because if you're a guy like me that's into reptiles and amphibians, they have the biggest and the best. I mean, true record breakers, and the salamander is a perfect example. I'm going to show you some more. Next image. Talk about snakes. Man, Asia's got the longest snake on the planet, which is the reticulated python. They also have the Burmese python, uh, which is right up there in the top three or four. The reticulated python gets longer than any snake on the planet. And I think that's the biggest snake I ever captured. And that was in a small island in Indonesia. And uh, I caught that snake. Well, I found it in a cave. Great story. Uh, there's been a long... A, a, a national zoo put up a really big reward. $100,000 if anybody could, could produce a living 30-foot snake. I mean, that's always been in the back of my mind because I get to go to all these places where there, where there are uh, a lot of snakes. Well, I was in this cave with my film crew and I looked in a, in a crack in the wall and I saw a coil big around as my body. And I was like, man, that's, our th that's a 30-foot snake. And the camera crew and we were high-fiving, fist bumping, like, man, we're going to get this reward. We're going to catch this snake. So I got a stick and I started poking and prodding down into this crack trying to get this giant snake 
to come out so we could capture it and, and weigh it. It wouldn't come out. Everything I did, tickle it, poke it, prod it, nothing. The snake would not come out. When you're in the field with a film with a film crew, time is money. You know, my producer's looking at his watch like, man, we got we got stuff to do. We can't stay here all day and poke and prod the snake. So I said, all right. So we left the crack. Came back the next day, snake is gone. So we finish up our film, we go home, fly back to the States, come back about six months later, we're back in the cave. I look in the same crack, same snake is there. I'm like, all right, poke it, prod it, tickle it, everything, snake won't come out. Same story. Come back next day, snake is gone. Third time is a charm is what they say. Well, I told this story to a lot of kids and kids started ideas of how to get that snake out of the crack and a little girl i think in like second or third grade came up with this idea and she goes dr brady it involves a ball of string a band-aid and a toothpick and that's how you can catch the giant snake so i was all ears so we go back for the third time to the to the snake cave in indonesia get to the crack i'm just hoping that snake's still there sure enough i look in the crack he's there so her plan was she said Take a band-aid, poke a hole in it, stick the string through, tie it to a toothpick, then reach in the crack and stick the band-aid onto the snake. Then it's attached to a giant ball of string. Then poke it and prod it and tickle it and do everything you want. And then the next day when you come back, you should be able to follow the string and find the snake. So we did as the little girl described. We came back the next day. We get to the entrance of the cave and I look down and sure enough, there's the string. The snake has left the cave. So we follow the string, we follow the string, follow it around this, through a, a rainforest down a river, about a hundred yards from the cave, we found this giant snake and that's it right there. A humongous, I think that was a 25 foot reticulated python. They're massive snakes, the world's longest, they reach lengths of about 30 feet. Uh, another true giant and record breaker from Southeast Asia. Next image. And it's not just big snakes. That's a king cobra. Southeast Asia is the home, or Asia is the home, to the king cobra, which is the longest venomous snake on the planet. One of the most dangerous snakes on the planet. And one that really gets my heart pumping. Because, man, those things, they are big. I mean, they get like 14, 15 feet long. I mean, they are really big and really big around and really intelligent and really dangerous. They hood up like we all know cobras do, but unlike other cobras that just hood up and then kind of just strike and fall towards you, the king cobra hoods up. And I mean, he, be, he may be, if it's, a, if it's a big one, it'll be looking you right in the eye. Hood up, look you in the eye, and then it can travel forward while hooded up and up off the ground. So you got this dangerous snake looking you in the eye, and chasing you, and it can move like that. They don't call it king for nothing. It, it truly is the king of venomous snakes. Um, it's a snake eater. It's, it eats a lot of snakes. Another record setter from Asia. Next image. Another record setter. We all know what that is, right? The world's largest lizard. That's the Komodo dragon. It's only found on a few uh, islands in the country of Indonesia. One of my favorite animals and, and some of the most amazing experiences I've ever had is with that animal right there. Crows you about nine or ten feet long, covered in body armor, um, strong as an ox, it's like a tank, got a mouthful of serrated recurved teeth, more similar to shark teeth than lizard teeth, and if that's not enough, it's venomous. If you just get a little nick or a little bite from this bad boy, you're in big, big trouble. Well, the first time I ever worked with those uh, giant lizards, I was working with some researchers that were trying to study how fast these, these giant lizards could move. So I said, man, that sounds pretty exciting. How are we going to do it? They said, well, I'll tell you what, we got a crazy idea. We're going to tie goat meat to your belt, and then we're going to have you run by the dragons, and then they're going to take off and chase you. And then we're going to use a radar gun to monitor the speed of the dragon while you're chasing. And I said, man, that's crazy, but I'm up for anything. So they tied goat meat to me. I started running through the forest. Man, these dragons swung in and started chasing me. And it was a great plan. I would run by, and they would, they would get a, a radar reading of speed, and then I'd come back the other way. They'd get another reading. The only thing we didn't think about was how do you stop? How do you get the dragons to stop chasing me? Well, I ran back and forth. Finally, I found a tree. I climbed the tree, and uh, that was the end of that story. So, Komodo Dragon, world's largest lizard.
Another record setter. Next image, please. We did get the next image. And then there are the Crocs. That, that's that's near and dear to my heart. It's how me, me and May Lynn met. Um, I'm a crocodilian expert. Um, largest croc on the planet is a saltwater croc found all the way through Asia. But then there are another of amazing species that are only found in Asia, like the gharial, the false gharial, the Siamese crocodile, the Chinese alligator. Next image, please. There's another big salty. Next image. I'm friends with all animals you see. That's a gharial, the most narrow snouted of all crocodilians, uh, exclusive to Asia. Next image. Dr. Mars, I just ask, uh, which is more dangerous, crocodiles or alligators? The answer to that one is the one that's got a hold of you. That's the quick, easy answer. Well, there's only two alligators, um, but there's 15 different types of crocodiles. So I would say crocodiles. There are some, like the salty is known to be really, really, um, uh, I hate to say aggressive, but the, the saltwater crocodile is involved in a lot of human uh, crocodile conflict. Uh, at the end of the day, they're all dangerous. You don't want to get close to any of them. But, man, they should be a real source of pride across Asia. This is a Siamese crocodile. They thought it was extinct in the wild. Talk about setting the bar high. National Geographic went out and told me to capture an extinct species. I was the first scientist to capture this animal in 50 years in Cambodia. Only place it's found. And just, just a beautiful animal. Next image. <clears throat> So there you go. But there's a few reasons why Asia is so special to me and why I made it my home for the last three years of my career at National Geographic. It's, it's the land of the giants, true record setters, the largest crocodile, the largest lizard, largest snake, largest venomous snake, largest salamander, largest freshwater turtle, largest saltwater turtle on the planet. And that's just that's the animal my field of expertise. We're not even talking about big cats and elephants and, and all these other things. It's an amazing place uh, filled with spectacular uh, flora and fauna. Now, I think that we have a snake that we're going to show as an example, and this is a spectacular animal. We're going to get May Lynn to get back over here. Are you want me to help me? Okay. This is a Burmese python, and um, it's it's a true giant of the snake world. Um, it's right up there with the anaconda and the reticulated python is one of the largest snakes on the planet. Yeah, you know, we're going to have to. It's so big, we're going to have to scoot the screen back. But this animal, people always ask, is this a dangerous snake? And I'm like, yeah, it's a dangerous snake. It's not venomous. It's what's called a constrictor meaning that it bites its prey and then it wraps its powerful coils around the prey and puts on the big squeeze. And it squeezes so tightly that blood can't flow through the body of the prey. So well, then a lot of people think, so the bite's not dangerous. I'm like, no, 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 no. The bite, the mouth, this, a python has a mouthful of teeth. It's like a bear trap, but it just uses that bite as an anchoring point to then throw the coils around. So the bite can be really bad, but not life-threatening. It's the squeeze of the snake, which is life-threatening. And a snake this size can kill a human very easily. This snake has 10,000 muscles in its body. We only have not even 1,000. And they're all designed to squeeze, to put on the big, big squeeze. But squeezing takes a lot of energy. So man, not only is this guy just full of brute force, but the muscles are also super sensitive because if it stops squeezing before it kills whatever it's after, like let's say it's a wild boar, um, that animal could kill the snake. So the snake's squeezing, 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 but the muscles are so sensitive, it can feel the heartbeat of its prey. So when the heart finally stops, oh, then the snake can relax. And then it has to swallow its prey whole. Crocodiles and snakes don't chew their food. Snakes have to swallow their food whole. So this guy's got a very elastic skull and jaw. This guy could probably swallow a volleyball very easily. Um, they can drop one side of the jaw down. Um, the, the skull is very flexible, but they don't chew their food. Have to swallow it whole. And I don't know if you can see it's tongue flicking. Probably the most noticeable thing about the snake is the tongue is constantly flicking. Uh oh, we got we got a little constricting going on over here on Teddy. 
But the tongue, it's tasting the air. It's got a specialized organ in the roof of its mouth. It's tasting the air looking for something that it wants to eat, whether it's a monkey or a wild boar or something like that. It also has special organs along its lips. It doesn't see the world like we do. It sees a thermal image. So it's seeing temperature differences. It would see us as dark reds and oranges because this guy preys on mammals and birds. One of the few animals that can hunt in total darkness. That's why you find them a lot in caves. That's why I was in the cave looking for the giant reticulated python. But again, um, a lot of these animals in the wild are threatened or endangered with extinction. Uh, we need to take better care of these guys. The illegal skin trade is just hammering these guys in the wild. But they've also been big in the news. A lot of you may have heard that in the Florida Everglades, this is an exotic species. It's the Burmese python, which is uh, usually the snake, usually the python that uh, is found there. And they're wreaking havoc in the Everglades, eating all the natural, um, natural animals. So it shouldn't be there, and they're trying to get rid of it the best they can. So that's the Burmese python, another spectacular animal that we have here at Eco Adventures. And uh, I'll tell you, the animals we have here are a lot more friendly than the ones you run into in the wild. So Malin's going to jump back in here. I'm going to jump back in here. All right, well, unfortunately, that's the end of the hour. I hope you guys learned a lot about our amazing animals here at Eco Adventures. Please come visit us. Uh, we're not too far away, like I said. We're only about 30 to 40 minutes. You can actually book this whole entire place to yourself for a private tour. 30 to 40 minutes from? From D.C. Yeah. They're all D.C. area. DC area. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, and then also, just to really quickly, because I think somebody asked if we can just quickly just do a little... Uh, yeah, so that you guys can see a little bit. Of just the pan around. Yeah. It's a simulated two-story rainforest. We have a lagoon, a crocodile swimming around, and we have all sorts of animals. Everything from tortoises to possums to armadillos to crocodiles, turtles, birds, and all animals in between. Maybe you can show Cafe. Thank you so much. Hey, love it, Yeah, I, I didn't love it. Yeah, more animals and more stories, and would love to see you. We have birthday parties, open play dates, summer camps, yep. scout programs, whatever you want, we can usually provide with live animals in a safe and educational uh, manner. All right, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for being here with us this evening, and have a great week. Take care. Thanks to our we volunteers, are. too.